lot of, you know, referential elements to do with reality, you know, how people really behaved in the real sense, how they reacted to the war, to racism, to regionalism and all that. And here today we'll, we'll see this, we'll connect this question of realism and reality to what we call even naturalism or something which is like, you know, what is naturally seen or felt, not just nature, it's not really only nature, we don't mean in a romantic sense to go back to nature and to the wilderness and to outside elements and so on, but to see how people really reflected uh, naturally and spontaneously and in a good way in their own writings, whether it's fiction or poetry or even in drama. And this is why we see again here to connect the question of impressionism, you know, impressionism that is your, uh, you know, what you really feel and the thing. Yeah, question? No, nothing. Okay. Um, so the idea here I'm trying to really say to you is um, uh, the the connection about writers how they how they reflect uh, as I say this idea of naturalism means to really give you details in exact details like in reality the details like like even scientific details. And this is in scientific details here, it means something really to do or close to reality as it is in real sense. And this is what we mean by, you know, if you like, naturalism or impressionism. Sometimes impressionism could be more maybe imaginative to some extent, but of course it's always drawing from reality. Okay? Another two points here in this connection, really, uh, we shall see here is what we call, as I said, um, and later on we shall see the same thing with the next uh, short story or the next small novel by Henry James called Daisy Miller, uh, is the same thing about this idea about, about these questions of realism and naturalism and so on. Again, the idea of determinism or fatalism, which is how sometimes, you know, you are fated to something or how you, or how writings or uh, literature in a way reflects this question about uh, fate and about how people are fated or determined or predetermined, or if you like, as we say, maybe pre-designed pre that is the question here of destiny and fate. Because people really believe in this about how sometimes you feel that this is your luck, this is your fate, and you can't change it. And really this is the idea when we say determinism. That is something already determined for you, and you can't, no matter what you try, you will not be able to change that. So this is what we mean here, or this is the connection we can think of in terms of what we say about fatalism or, you know, again, the word fatalism really here to do with death. You know, when you are fated like fate and, you know, as I say, destiny, if it's your fate and destiny to do this or to, uh, for example, commit something, then it's fate. There's no way you can change it. And I think the writers here many times really questioned this idea. And sometimes they wanted to challenge this idea. And mostly writers reflected that, that man, man faces his fate, tries to face, confront his face and destiny, but the result is tragic because no one can challenge maybe here the idea according to many american thinkers and philosophers and maybe religious people to say you can't you can't challenge this because it is fate and destiny and luck and blah 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 so
So really here, this idea is quite interesting and maybe maybe uh, important to uh, contemplate and think about and, and really decide how and what uh, really to think of that. And, you know, this is what we mean here by, you know, determinism and fatalism. Okay, let me just for a second. Okay, so, um, yeah. Do you, uh, do you see what I'm saying here? Do you understand? Yes, doctor. Very good. Now, really the, the big uh, uh, example, or maybe it's not really very big, here I chose for you one really lovely short story by Jack London. And Jack London uh, is, is a, I think, very important author, 20th century, early 20th century uh, author, novelist, short story writer, really. He was, he was such a great uh, man in every sense, and all his fiction really is an embodiment. All his writings is an embodiment of what we are talking here about realism, naturalism, fatalism, etc., etc. Uh, most of his fiction deal with questions to do with how man wanted to challenge reality. Well, I mean, let's say nature or the powers of nature like um, giving you the best examples really he's uh, reflecting about you know the sea you know the power of the sea and you can see for example many many writers in america because they have this huge amount of oceans around the american continent you know you have a lot of water and sea towards the east and even south and even west and even sometimes in lakes and big rivers and all that so all these natural elements as i say reflected in nature and and sometimes even when you don't have even rivers or waters or lakes or oceans people even challenge or wanted to challenge other powers of nature like rain or like snow or like ice or like you know climbing up mountains and all this so here what we mean by fatalism in a sense or the challenge of nature jack london wrote a lot of fiction concerning the sea novel and it's called sea fiction and in in american literature we have other great examples and i mentioned for you the first example i have mentioned before at the beginning of this term really is by Moby, is by Herman Melville. And I did not really have time to give it to you as an example, because, you know, um, my colleagues thought that this should be um, or must not be given at this time. It should have been given in the previous American Survey 1, but really we did not give it there. And I thought really Moby Dick, Moby Dick by Herman Melville, is a very amazing unbelievable great text about the sea facing the sea and the challenge and how man is such adamant or stubborn or crazy about being strong to face the sea and facing the sea and the power of the sea and the power of the ocean embodied of course in the power of this whale because this is the challenge and the fight between Ahab, you know, the main character in Moby Dick, and Moby Dick himself, the name of the big, big white whale, you know, and really this is an amazing example. And again, uh, many other writers did the same thing, and the best example later on in the 20th century is Ernest Hemingway in a great uh, novel also called The Old Man and the Sea. The Old Man and the Sea. Again, the same thing, the challenge of a fisherman, how a fisherman wanted to go fishing, and he hunted a big massive fish, again, a big shark fish, and the ways in which he tried to catch this fish, and so on. 
So all these things really I'm saying here reflecting, you know, how man, how human beings, man, if you like, um, you know, wanted to challenge these powers and which is of course to say it's not easy and it's even impossible to challenge nature. You can't challenge nature. You can't, just simply, you cannot challenge nature in so many perspectives or so many respects. And I think this is the idea here uh, in Jack London. Jack London, as I said, he wrote a really great uh, novel called, one well, well, good novel called The Sea Wolf. The Sea Wolf. It's a great novel by, by Jack London. Again, many of his novels and short stories also deal with these really lovely, lovely texts uh, associated with nature, mainly the sea and the ocean and water and the challenge of this and so on. This short story we have today is called, is really to do with facing, um, you know, other elements of nature, which is the snow to travel in a really wintry, absolutely snowy, massively snowy day, and you face your day, or you face, you think you are a strong man, and you can face all the challenges, but then when it comes to the last bits of, you know, uh, testing of how powerful you are, you fail. As a human being, as a man, you fail you fail because you are a man, you are a human being. You have limited, limited power. You have limited power. You don't have, you know, this complete extreme power. What, and, and this is where one, you know, how we link and connect the question of fatalism and the question of determinism to say, you think, you think you can do that, but of course you try and try and try but then you lose, you lose. And here, the, the short story called To Build a Fire. This boy, this man here, wanted to start a fire, to build a fire in the middle of a snow, absolutely snow, you know, blizzard, or really a snowstorm, which is amazingly cold. And he wanted to build a fire to, bo to warm himself. And really, it's an amazing text, how to see how this man in, in this, he tried and tried and tried and tried, but he failed. And then finally, he got killed. He got frozen and died in the middle of the snow. And really, this, this novel or short story, really, it's not a novel. A short story, it, it, it really embodies this idea about uh, you know, the question of challenging uh, wildlife or challenging things. And the funny thing is to see that this man had a dog with him and the dog was able to save himself or itself, whereas the man failed to save himself. And really this is funny in a way, in a way, to say that, you know, even the dog knew that this is not the time or this is a bad time to travel in the middle of a of a storm a snowstorm and that's why maybe the dog was able to come back or to run away or something to save itself unlike our friend uh, the main character or what we call could be the hero in this short story as you can see to build a fire was written uh, 1910 and really it's a big amazing big uh, uh, you know achievement um, and here I uh, I show you the novel let me see uh, how many pages well it's about seven or eight pages in my um, in my edition yeah well nine pages yes only nine eight and a half but really, I asked you last time, I don't know if I did, but if I did not, I should have to read the whole thing because it's an unbelievably lovely text. It's narrated by the main, the main character, 
you know, this man himself who wanted, uh, again, if you like, um, it's narrated really by a third person narrator, I should say. And, you know, the switching between, you know, the third person narrator and and the main the main character here who is uh, is the subject of our story here to build a fire now um, let me let me um, oh somebody said uh, are we speaking about the yellow paper oh no 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 we have finished with yellow paper. Do you have any question about the um, the yellow wallpaper? Sarah, you asked about your, the the yellow paper. Sarah? Uh, it's when we were speaking about fatalism. I thought you mean the, wall, uh, the yellow wallpaper. But I got it now. I know that oh, we are no, speaking. I'm about. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I said that I told you to read the last bits yourselves and i think um i don't really need to go back to it because it's clear it's simple i mean even the last section i said when she said why i wrote the short story and i think it's clear i don't need to re re-explain what is already clear i think anyway yes, if you, yeah if you still feel if you really still feel you need uh, something about it i can go back to it no problem yeah, somebody said, you said you have some points to add. Well, really, there are things that you can pick up from the text yourself. Maybe I, um, I thought I will leave this for you to do uh, in your own way. I think that's, uh, I thought this is enough. I don't want to go back and spend because really the topic is quite simple. And I, as I said, it's purely psychological. And there are a lot of psychological things and, and i think it's clear from the way she did it and the way she said it about her relationship to her man and uh, you know the all um, elements that she she wanted us to be happy with or to convince us about and so on but still if you if you want me really um, to to check it back again i will no problem Anyway, I'm talking here today about uh, about um, to build the fire. Have you read it? Anybody read it? Hello? Uh, Doctor, we thought we will study uh, a girl in the street. Are we skipping that one? Oh, no, no, I, I skipped that because I skipped that because I thought this is too much. We don't have time really to do it. Because it's similar to, it's similar to some extent uh, close to the question of feminism. And I decided even before that, and the question of naturalism and reality. And I thought that's enough. Really, we don't need to go back again because again, the other short story we will have or the other novella we are going to study by Henry James. It's closer to that, but I think that one also was full of, uh, full of colloquialism, full of slang and colloquial language. And I thought, uh, really, we don't really have time for this. Really, it's too much. I thought uh, we don't really need it, and that's why I crossed it. So, that's uh, one by, as I told you, I think I said, I said this and I mentioned that, by Stephen Crane, no longer Stephen Crane is included. No, no Stephen Crane, okay? Okay, doctor. Yeah. Um, so I'm saying now, anybody read to build a fire? Anybody read it or decided or read one page or something? No? Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like your honesty. People saying no, it's okay, good, no problem. 
Right, really the story, I maybe if I uh, share with you uh, the, um, the story and I will start uh, showing you exactly, and this is, as you can see here, you can see my page now, Jack London, and the story, short story, as I said, it's about seven, seven, eight or nine pages, really, it's a great no uh, short story, because as I say, really, it's a very good example about this idea of facing reality, facing trouble, accepting the challenges. They had broken cold and the gray, exceedingly cold and the gray, when the man turned aside from the main Yukon Trail and climbed the high earth bank where a dim and little traveled trail led the eastward through the fast, through the fat spruce timberland. Now you can see, of course, from the first sentence here, really you can see the kind of, uh, you know, narrative we have. You know, the narrative we have. Oh, and by the way, I, I remember now about the word narrative. Some of you really, quite, quite some of you were saying to me in the exam about uh, Booker Washington and they say the narrative and first person narrator. In Booker Washington, there is no narrator. Booker Washington is writing his own life. It's an autobiography. It's not fiction. There are no narrators. No narrator. We say narrative metaphorically speaking but we don't mean as fictional it is autobiography means reality means history you are writing your own life yes it's close to reality i mean to close to fiction but it's not fiction when you say to me you know booker washington is the first person narrator no 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 you are mixing here between what is fiction and what is autobiography? Okay. And again, I corrected many of you. When I say when you refer to the writer, you use the surname, not the first name. Don't say Walt. And don't say, um, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, just say, for example, uh, Mark. Always, when you talk about authors, use their family name. Say uh, Scott, say Dickens, say Shakespeare. We don't say William. We, we never say William. Either you say the full name, Walt Whitman, or don't say Walt. Because when you say Walt, I crossed it. I crossed it. It's not acceptable. In criticism, we never do that. And maybe some of you would have noticed this. I corrected these things for you in the exam. And here, really, London, uh, Jack London here, you see, you can see London because it's Jack, is writing really, you can see really the lovely uh, narrative, which is full of, you know, things to do with nature. Here you can see the third person's narrative or third person narrator explaining the scenery where this man started his journey. And notice here when we say, when the man turned aside, uh, we go on and go on and on, you know, mentioning when you just say the man. And then later, maybe I'm, I really um, will see when exactly we see maybe his name mentioned. Notice. Again, this is uh, the idea, the details given about natural elements is just to say how the writer really spends time to give us all these details about these really natural things to feel the, the atmosphere. Cold and gray, and he repeated that, exceedingly cold and gray, when the man turned aside from the Yukon, main Yukon trail. Again, Yukon, you remember he's using here, we are using 
many old, uh, maybe Indian words, originally Native American phrases or words used by Native Americans to do with the maybe names of tribes or something. So, so the Yokon here refers to one of those Indian, Red Indian Native American, uh, uh, you know, tribes. Where a dim and little traveled trail led us eastward through the fat spruce timberland. It was a steep bank and he paused for breath at the top, excusing the act to himself by looking at his watch. It was nine o'clock. There was no sun. There was no sun, nor hint of sun, though there was not a cloud in the sky. It was a clear day, and yet there seemed, there seemed an intangible pull over the face of things a subtle gloom that made the day dark and that was due to the absence of the of sun again notice really the amazing description of you know that describing the day and there's no sun although there are no clouds he said but there's no sun where is the sun why the sun is uh, is hidden or can't be seen. He said, no cloud, not a cloud. You know, he said, clear day, but, but where is the sun? The fact did not worry the man. He was used to the lack of sun. It had been days since he had seen the sun. And he knew that a few more days must pass before that cheerful orb due south would just peep above the skyline and dip immediately from view. You know, in reality, of course, you say, how can this happen, doctor? Well, in the South Pole and in the North Pole, sometimes you have, you have, I don't know how many days of the year, you really, you don't, have, you don't see the sun at all. You don't see the sun at all. At some points, I'm not sure how long, really. I must check this to see how long sometimes you spend, um, you know, you, you think you have the day, but there's no sun, right? So really, the whole thing could be, you know, could be a little bit illuminated, could be a little, a little bit illuminated, but there's no sun. And of course, the idea here could be symbolical. Maybe it's to do with the weather. It's so terrible and so bad. But still, this man is decided to go into this journey, you know, which is to go in uh, in his, if you like, uh, mission that he's uh, he's doing. The man flung a look back along the way he had come. You see, the narrator, I said, the narrator goes on and on and on about describing uh, this uh, scenery about, you know, as I said, and this is really the idea about, you know, nature, nature or naturalism or realism in a good sense. And I look back along the way he had come. The Yukon lay a mile wide and hidden under three, three feet of ice. Well, three, three feet of ice. Three feet means more than 80, 80 centimeters. Nearly one meter thick of ice. Is this the time to travel? Is this the time to travel? On top of this ice, were as many feet of snow. <laughs> My God, not just ice at the bottom, but on top of that, you have more, let's say, notice, many feet of snow. It was all pure white, rolling in gentle adulations were the ice jams of the freeze up 
had formed. So the whole atmosphere is really terrifying. And no man with real sense would, would, would go out at this time. North and south, as far as his eyes can see or could see, it was unbroken white save for a dark hairline that curved and twisted from around the spruce-covered island to the south. And that curved and twisted away into the north, where it disappeared behind another spruce-covered island. This dark hairline was the trail, the main trail, you know, the road, which is not road. You know, it's really completely, he said, covered, covered with snow. So here really you can say, you know, any sensible man would not go out. Any sensible man would not, would not, would not go out and, you know, expose himself or herself to such absolute trouble and misery. So notice here um, how he uh, said all this. The dark hair line was the trail, the main trail that led south 500 miles to the um, Chilcot Pass um, Daya and salt water. Of course, he's talking, remember, talking about American scenery and about, about American life and all that really it's, it's um, really reference to all so many, if you like, sites and parts of American American life. The salt water, and that led north 70 miles to Dawson. And still on the north, a, a, a thousand miles to New Gulato, or New Lato, sorry. And finally to St. Michael, and so on. You know, he's, he's giving all this area a thousand, a thousand miles and a half, a thousand miles or more and more. Now, I really need uh, to take a little, I will take a little, only two minutes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I need two minutes break. Uh, just two minutes, huh? and I'll come back in a second. Two minutes.
Ja, okay. Ähm. Yeah, was I sharing? I don't mean I lost sharing. What is it? Yeah. So you can see here the narrator telling us how this man is decided. Notice the way he is looking at this. His way, and you can see how much he he is spending time thinking about this. Notice the next paragraph. By all this, the mysterious far-reaching hairline trail, the absence of sun from the sky, the tremendous cold, and the strangeness and weirdness of all of um, you know again saying of of it all, right? made no impression on the man. It was not because he was long used to it. He was a newcomer to the land. So again, notice here the narrator is giving us all these things about, you know, the whole idea being strange and weird. And this man, you know, as if to say that he's, he, you know, he doesn't know. Uh, or he didn't listen to people saying to him, don't go. And here the narrator say he was a newcomer, a newcomer to this area. But you see, when you are told by people who live in this area and listen to them or, you know, giving you, you, know, giving you advice about it, notice the trouble with him was that he was without imagination. Mm -hmm. You see? So life, really this is the idea. Life is not just facts. Life is not only facts and, you know, sciences. And really this is the idea because this, here we shall see that you need your imagination. You need your imagination. And there is imagination. And here you say, the only problem with him that this man has no imagination, you know? He was quick and alert in the things of life, you see? Quick and alert in the things of life, but only the things. Uh, again, I think this is really important idea. And I think this is one of the thing of the main themes in this short story, which is the clashes, the real the real differences or the contrasts or the relationship between reality and the imagination. Or, you know, again what we say here between between reality or the idea of the significance of uh, appearances. What you see as real is something, and what you can read beyond it is something else. And that's the idea, not only the thing, and not in the senses. So really the idea that it's not enough to know everything in, 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 in life, but you have to read beyond those things. Notice here, 50 degrees below zero meant 80 odd degrees of frost. When you are sure and told that this is a terrible, absolutely terrible weather, and you are told, don't go out at this time, you will be killed. 50 degrees below zero, hmm? such fact impressed him as being cold and uncomfortable. Well, only that? Cold and uncomfortable? And that was all. And that's why really the main thing here about this man is two, two really here, if you like, two, uh, you know, arrogant 
to accept the facts of life. And the imagination that he has is very narrow, if you like. Okay? It did not lead him to meditate upon his frailty as a creature of temperature. You see, this is it. People have to think, notice here, to meditate upon his frailty as a creature of temperature. People are weak. We are frail. Notice here, man's, man's frailty in general. Yes, man originally is weak. No matter what. No matter what. And I think this is the challenge. You can't challenge nature. You can't challenge elements, any elements, water or fire or snow or whatever. It's impossible. And I think that's his mistake here because he challenged that and he paid heavily. He was killed. Able only to live within certain narrow limits of heat and cold. You see, we are conditioned here. We can live only within certain amounts of heat and cold. We can't be everywhere all the time, anywhere, everywhere, all the time, regardless of the weather. No, we cannot. And I think that's one of the main issues here in the problem, how you challenge how you face fate, your fate, or again here the question of determinism, that he, he is determined by these conditions and he can no way, he can no way run away from them. Notice, and from there on it, did it, did it not lead him to the con conjectural field of immortality? And man's place in the universe, 50 degrees below zero, zero stood, 40 stood for bite of rust that hurt and that must be regarded, sorry, and guarded against by the use of mittens, warm, warm moccasins, or you know, this is saying about how much things that he used to wear to keep himself warm. Moccasins and thick shoes. 50 degrees below zero was to him just precisely 50 degrees below zero. That there should be anything more to it than that was a thought that ever, that never entered his head. <coughs> and I think this is true. People, people have to think and how to behave and in what sense. And, you know, again, to understand that there are elements in your life you can't live, you can't live without. And really here to say, no matter how you try, no matter how you try and prepare yourself, you will fail. And, you know, he goes on uh, here really in a very lovely way. As he turned to go on, he spat speculatively. There was a sharp explosive crackle that startled him. Uh, remember again, really here, he, of course, the narrator saying about, about his, you know, his lack of speculation or his lack of judgment, really. Again, when you say he was looking and deciding and you know, if you name, and they say here you know, he startled and spat and spat again, you know, and again the air, of course, notice here, before it fell, it could fall, sorry, to the snow, the spittle crackled, the, he knew that a 50 below spite crackled on the snow, but this spittle had crackled in the air. Undoubtedly, it was 50 below, and, you know, you can see here the elaboration about the degrees, the 50 degrees below, um, below zero. And you can say, you know, again, um, it's very difficult to understand 
why this man is doing this job again that's why he failed he failed miserably because you cannot you cannot challenge nature undoubtedly it was colder than 50 below how much colder he did not know but the temperature did not matter he was bound for the old claim notice all the claim on the left fork um, of Henderson Creek, where the boys were already, they had come over across uh, the divide from the Indian Creek County, our country. Again, you can see, um, you know, the narrator giving you really a lot of details about that. Just, just to show us how journey. Look at the next paragraph again. He plung, he plunged in among the big spruce trees. The trail was faint. A foot of snow had fallen since the fast, the last sled had passed here. So again, as you can see, he was the only traveler. Nobody, nobody, nobody would go in the, in such a terrible weather. Again, please. Um, you know, I uh, really, um, I want to highlight more of this for you, but really we can't read all this, uh, or at least I can't read it here in class because it's, um, you know, there are a lot of details which are lovely and I want you really to read this on your own. Please read it on your own carefully and see uh, the ideas and the connection. Yes, maybe different ideas, different collections, or whatever. So, but but they can be, they can be, uh, if you like, connected somehow. Now, uh, really, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I uh, I really want to stop uh, here today, and I will continue uh, next time. If you.